Let me go to Big Head Joe's for you. They have the most insane burritos. I don't much go for ethnic food. No, 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 trust me. They have one that's called the Meat Tornado. Literally killed a guy last year. You had me at Meat Tornado. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, and welcome to the new Binging with Babish Kitchen, a sprawling two-level garden apartment that I have retrofitted into the play place of my dreams. I'll be taking you guys on a proper tour of this space soon so you can see all the new toys and tools that, as you can imagine, I want to keep safe. So it's fitting that this week's sponsor, Simply Safe, is helping me keep my new home secure. Simply Safe is an award-winning home security system with no contracts. It's also super easy to set up. It took me less than an hour to get mine up and running for the new house. Visit simplysafe.com slash babish to learn more. Now before we dig into the meat tornado, we must first go back in time to the old apartment, where I enlisted some help from an expert to ensure that this burrito could in fact kill a man. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Uh, I understand that you are a doctor of nutrition. Yes, I'm a medical doctor and I'm what they call a physician nutrition specialist. I'm recognized by the National Board of Physician Nutrition Specialists. Well, it sounds like they could really use somebody like you in Pawnee, Indiana, because as I understand, it's a very unhealthy town. Oh, well, that's what, that's what the, uh, the clip you showed me implies. <laughs> yeah. For sure. According to legend of this um, burrito place in Pawnee, a gentleman uh, uh, was killed by a burrito referred to as the meat tornado. Oh, boy, oh, yeah. There actually are true cases of death by meat consumption, usually plate, and those are called cafe coronaries. Now, if it was in a Mexican restaurant, so that, you wouldn't call that a cafe coronary, I guess you'd call that a cochina <laughs> coronary, right? So you, you are you are an, a doctor of nutrition and humor, it would seem. Well, trying to be a little humorous, but, <laughs> but yeah, you could die from eating. So let's think about not just the meat, but the burrito is going to have spices in it, right? So if it was a really hot chili, that could, somebody who has existing coronary disease, then they could then induce a coronary. Yeah, that, that could happen. So assume that there are no size limitations on this burrito. Uh, can you think of a, just a rough idea of you have a patient that has heart issues, don't eat this much meat, or it could kill you where you sit? <laughs> I would say you're probably in that category, yeah, in the pounds worth of consumption. All right, so I, I, th I think maybe the benchmark I'm trying to hit is maybe like two pounds worth of meat. All right, well, that was, <laughs> wow. I mean, as, lo as long as it kills them, that's uh, that's uh, that's my end game. Yes, it could kill them. All right, well, I'm going to try to do this as, as true to form to uh, what we've determined here, and... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to have this be a message of health because you shouldn't eat <laughs> things called a meat tornado. I don't think. No, I would. I think that's one to, to stay away from. So, well, thank you so much for talking with me today, Doctor. I appreciate it, and thanks uh, thanks for saving lives. Armed with this lethal knowledge, I set out to make a two-pound spicy bean and meat-filled burrito with a license to kill. First up, flank steak in a simple marinade of a quarter cup each lemon juice, vegetable oil, soy sauce, and chicken stock. Half a teaspoon cayenne pepper, one tablespoon ground cumin, a quarter cup of white sugar, two crushed cloves of garlic, and about a tablespoon each kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper. And because we're trying to be legit or authentic or whatever, a whole lot of fresh chopped cilantro. Tiny whisk until homogenous, and then we're going to pour it over our flank steak to make a sort of carne asada. Remember that marinating your meat in a bowl or casserole helps prevent cross-contamination in the fridge. Once everybody's evenly bathed in the marinade, we're going to cover and fridge for about four hours, flipping once or twice throughout the process. Now on to the next meat of mention, carnitas, for which we're going to need a whole bone-in pork shoulder, which we must first debone, de-skin, and de-fat to some extent. Basically, we want to scrape as much meat off the bone as possible, remove and reserve the skin if you want to make chicharrones, remove any excess fat, and cut the meat into two inch pieces, which we're going to cook in what some might call an irresponsible amount of lard. Two pounds of the stuff, along with one cup of water, go into a large, wide, deep Dutch oven, which we're going to set over medium-high heat until 
the lard is completely melted. And then, slowly and carefully, we're going to add the pork to the party. In addition to the pork, we're going to add the juice and flesh of two large navel oranges, cut in half. Just squeeze them, drop them in, and bring this whole thing to a bare simmer. Once the simmer is reached, lower the heat to medium low and maintain a bare simmer for about two hours. At first, the pork is going to braise, but then once all the water evaporates, it's going to start to effectively deep fry. After the first hour, we're going to fish out the orange rinds and replace them with half a large onion, roughly chopped, and four large cloves of garlic, crushed, four dried bay leaves, two sticks of cinnamon, a teaspoon of whole cumin seeds, and a tablespoon of Mexican oregano. This, as you can well imagine, is going to smell unbelievable, but we're not done. We're also adding a half cup each light Mexican beer and evaporated milk, which at first I thought was kind of odd, but as the pork simmered for an additional hour, it turned out to be awesome. All the milk proteins separated and adhered to the meat and began to brown gorgeously, leaving me with crispy on the outside, juicy on the inside, tender, flavorful carnitas, which I'm gonna go ahead and fridge until we're ready to use because they're gonna reheat beautifully right back in the oil. Next up, our chicken representative at the table is going to be pinga de pollo, a simple braised spicy, saucy, shredded chicken, which we're going to make as juicy as possible by searing skin-on, bone-in chicken breasts, which is both going to protect the delicate meat, give us some nice flavor in the braise, and give us some nice fond on the bottom of the pot. Once the chicken has some color on both sides, we're setting it aside and dumping in one large onion, roughly chopped, and two cloves of garlic. We're just sautéing those for a few minutes, letting them pick up some color and letting them pick up all that good stuff on the bottom of the pot. Then we are deglazing with one cup of chicken stock, one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, a 14 ounce can of crushed fire roasted tomatoes, and one can of chipotle chilies in adobo sauce. We're also going to add one teaspoon each ground cumin and Mexican oregano. Bring the whole affair to a rolling simmer and drop the chicken breasts back in the hot tub, where they're going to braise for about 45 minutes until the chicken is nice and tender and cooked through, and so are the vegetables. Once everybody's nice and happy, we're going to pull the chicken breasts out and use an immersion blender to blend our vegetables and chilies into a smooth but still little chunky sauce. Then once we've removed the chicken's bones and skin, we're we're going to shred it using two forks and return it and any accumulated juices back to the pan. Season with kosher salt, freshly ground pepper, and simmer for 10 or so minutes just to let those flavors get to know each other. Taste for seasoning and then it's time to contend with the final fighter in our meat cage match. Our flank steak has finished marinating and is ready for the grill, or in this case the plancha. Once we've removed some of the excess herbs and garlic so they do not burn, this guy's going to respond especially well to any super hot cooking surface. I'm going with some well lubricated and thoroughly preheated cast iron. Once little wisps of smoke emerge from its surface, we lay down the steak and leave it undisturbed for about five minutes, until its first side has been emblazoned with a deep dark brown char. The sugar in the marinade is what helps give this steak its beautiful crust, and it is going to hang out in the oven while we prepare the final element of our burrito, the burrito, for which we're going to need one extra large tortilla. Into the bowl of the food processor goes eight and a half ounces of all-purpose flour, a teaspoon of kosher salt, and two ounces of refrigerator cold lard. Press this together until it resembles coarse crumbs, and then we're going to slowly add three quarters of a cup of cold water while the machine runs until a rough ball of dough forms, which we're going to knead on a lightly floured work surface until it feels smooth and elastic. Then we're going to wrap it in plastic wrap and let it rest at room temperature for about 15 minutes because its gluten needs to be very relaxed for what we're about to put it through. That's right, little ball of dough, you are not being used to make 8 to 12 separate tortillas. No, no, you are going to make one giant tortilla. First, we gotta preheat our paella pan, maybe practice our scoop technique. Also, we gotta make sure that it's preheated evenly since it's so much bigger than the flame. Once it's good and smoking hot, we're gonna lower the flame a little bit while we roll out our tortilla on a generously floured work surface. I was going for a tortilla with about the same diameter as my paella pan, which turned out to be my first of many mistakes. After gently unfurling it, much like a pie crust, I learned that it should indeed be slightly smaller than the paella pan, otherwise this is gonna happen. I tried my darndest to salvage this giant giant tortilla, but it also turned out to be very, very tender. And because I was focused on it tearing so easily, I forgot to help it cook evenly in the paella pan. So it ended up being burnt in the center, raw on the outsides, ripped, torn, and full of holes. But let me ask you this, Master Wayne. Why do we fall? Well, Alfred, it's so we can learn how to pick ourselves up. On my next try, I used only half the batch of dough, which I rolled out thinner and smaller. I also kneaded the dough twice as long so as to develop the gluten so it wouldn't be so delicate. Immediately after getting it in the pan, I tried to evenly disperse the heat so the tortilla would cook evenly. And rather than use a rolling pin, I'm not entirely sure why I did that, I used a pizza peel to flip the gargantuan tortilla. Cheers emanated through the kitchen as it was successfully flipped, and we could all see 
the burrito that it was to become. Once cooked, there was only one thing left to do, turn it into a meat delivery system. So back over on the worktop, we're gonna start prepping our meat for burrito insertion. The flank steak is very important to slice thinly across the grain. If you slice it with the grain, you're gonna end up chewing on shoestrings rather than meat. The carnitas, once reheated, need only be shredded or chopped into bite-sized pieces. They are one of the most delicious substances on planet Earth, and if there's one thing to make from this episode, it's them. Because as we established with Dr. Rothkopf, what we're about to do you should not attempt at home. The time has come to stack our tortilla proudly. Carne asada, followed by carnitas. Then I'm laying down the cheese and topping with tinga de pollo so it melts more effectively. Some refried beans to help induce cafe coronary. And since we want this thing to be spicy, I can think of no better final topping than a few big glugs of the last dab I was given as a consolation prize for being on Hot Ones. And as you can see, I am not being sparing with this hot sauce that clocks in at more than 2 million Scoville units. Last but not least, we gotta make a burrito out of this thing, so I'm going to try my best to employ proper burrito rolling technique. Tuck in the sides, roll it over on itself, tuck in the bottom, carry the seven, and there you have it folks, a slightly sloppy but nonetheless legitimate meat tornado. And I'm sorry you can't see the numbers on the scale, but it clocks in at 1 pound 15.8 ounces. So I'm comfortable with going ahead and calling this a two pounder. Before we can dig in, of course, we have to take a look at that cross section. And unfortunately, I got a little excited and cut in too early so the cheese wasn't fully melted yet, but I was still nothing short of ecstatic to dig in. And I'll tell you something, folks, it was blow your pants off delicious. It was something I would have made a valiant effort to enter into the clean plate club until I remembered it was positively slathered in the last dab. Oh no, oh, oh no. <laughs> oh. Oh, it's hot. I want another bite. Ah, that's hot. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, that could kill a guy. Thanks again to Simply Safe for sponsoring this episode. Like I said before, the setup process is easy and fast. The system is shipped to your house and then you install it yourself. It took me less than an hour. They've got sensors to cover every window, room, and door, plus other extras like temperature sensors and HD cameras. Not only do they look sleek, they work great too. You can choose the pieces that work best for you in your home and pick the monitoring plan you want with no contracts. So thank you Simply Safe for helping me keep my new home safe. Visit simplysafe.com slash babish to learn more. The link is in the video description below. Thank you.